All right, so let's talk about some spring splits. Uh, let's see. We're going to talk tonight about when you do your splits, the timing of splits, the different methods of splits, feeding splits, queens and splits, and how many times you can split a hive. And then what do you do for mites when you're making splits? Do you treat for mites first or do you split and do mites later? So let's jump right into it. Uh, let's first talk about the timing. And so I've got, yeah, when to split. So that's the timing. When to split is kind of together with timing, I guess. But timing of a split, we really want to make sure it's warm enough to support a split. And we have to do it um, to avoid a swarm. So the perfect time to split a hive is when you have enough resources out there that the, the bees can get a lot of uh, nectar from all the resources out there to support the split. And it's got to be warm enough because I've made splits too early, guys, and it's turned out bad. I, I, I chilled my brood and what enough bees in the split to keep them warm. Uh, sometimes the foragers, a lot of the foragers go back to the parent hive and uh, they had chilled brood. A lot of them had issues. So split it too early, get a cold snap. It's, it's hard on, on the splits. So you want to make sure that it is warm enough and you want to do it before the parent hive swarms. So there, I wish there was a simple, easy answer. I know it'd be so great if I could give you a date, like April the 4th, make your splits. But everybody lives in different places. Even here, I could say April the 4th, and next, next year it could be April the 30th, or it could be March the 30th. You know what I mean? So you have to go by the temperature. You have to go by what kind of resources you have out in the field to support the split that you're going to do. So that's kind of when you do it. And I'll take your questions a little bit later. We'll talk more about it. So if you have some questions, um, be sure and jot those down. But it's going to be important for us to realize that we really need to make sure it's going to be warm enough. And how warm is warm enough? I would say uh, no, certainly no colder than freezing. It's got to be above freezing and preferably in the 40s. Thanks, Lynn, for your donation tonight. I appreciate your supporting the channel. Now, I want to talk about uh, different split methods. And um, I think this is interesting when I hear people talk about different ways that you can make splits and there's different names people call them. And, and um, it's interesting in beekeeping because a lot of times it's the people who came up with the idea that they get to call it, uh, it's called by their name. And we have a lot of things in beekeeping that are called by the name of the person, like the bee escape that goes in the inner cover. That's the Porter, P-O-T-T-E-R, Porter bee escape, because it was um, it was created by Mr. Porter. And then we had the Boardman entrance feeder. Mr. Boardman came up with that. It goes on and on. You know, the, uh, the Langstroth hive, of course, was uh, created by Reverend Langstroth. So a lot of times these splits also get names associated with them as well. But when it all comes down to it, don't get bogged down in the different names of, of, the, of the methods, I guess, the names of the methods, because a split is really just always going to be taking bees out of the parent hive and moving them away into their own hive so they become a separate colony. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And so um, I'm going to explain a few of these for you real quickly. One of them that's that we refer to a lot, and you've he you've heard a lot of people talk about the walkaway split. And a walkaway split can be defined, and and actually it can be done in so many different ways. It really can be. You can, if you had, let's say, if you had a hive out there that had two deeps on it, it's overwintered, and now that you want to prevent a swarm and take uh, make a split. So you can have two hives now. And if the hive is so full that you have brood in the top box and brood in the bottom deep as well, then you could take the top deep off and walk away with it and put it on a bottom board and a top cover. And now you've got two hives. You've made a split. The queen's in one. And really, it doesn't matter where the queen is, really, as long as there's eggs in both sections, whichever one did not get the queen, they're going to raise a queen. So you don't have to worry about it unless you want to put a mated queen in, then you got to find out where the queen is so that you can put your new queen that you buy in the queenless section. 
Now that's called a walk away. However, a walk away does not have to be the way I just described it. A walk away can also refer to the way I do it. And I show up with a nu nucleus, a nuke box, and it supports five frames. It's about nine inches wide, a nuke box is. And I go into a, a very healthy, strong overwinter colony. And I personally find my queen, which frame she's on. It'd be a frame full of eggs. I move that over into the five frame nuke box. And then I'll move another frame of brood. And then I'll move um, a couple of frames of honey and pollen for food support. And then one frame that's sort of mostly empty, drawn out foundation um, to give them room to expand. And so that can still be a walk, called a walk away split because I'm walking away with some of the frames that I took out of the larger hive. And of course, remember, for those of you that are new to beekeeping or thinking about beekeeping, uh, you always have to replace the frames that you take out of the parent hive with frames, either drawn or undrawn foundation. You can't leave blank spaces in a beehive. So don't forget that. So a walk away split also can be done where you you leave the parent, uh, you leave the queen in the parent hive and you pull five frames out, as I described, and walk away with a queenless nucleus. And then you either let them raise their own queen as long as they have eggs, or you've already bought a queen and you have her ready in a queen cage behind some candy to put her in there. And so you can do it that way as well. Now, with a walkaway split, some challenges are that you have to make sure it's warm enough to support a smaller colony. It's only five frames. Remember, our bees are getting through winter because there's a lot of bees in there. When you pull five frames out and some of the foragers are going to go back, there are not going to be as many bees in there to support a lot of heat in a cold evening. So we're still in, you know, even in spring, we can have very cold nights. So you have to weigh that option out. Um, the other thing is that you, if you, um, in my case, I, I take my queen with me. I take the the mother queen out of the parent hive and I put her in my split and I'm doing that to reduce swarming because they can't swarm without a queen. What I do, I allow my parent hive to raise their own queen. It helps with my control. They have a lot of brood, so they're not really hurting. It doesn't, it doesn't take that long. Sometimes I can get a queen laying again in 20, 21 days or 25 days pretty quickly, you know? So, um, but it can take up to 30 days. You can always, if you can find a queen, you can always buy a mated queen and have, have those in ready to go. But that's kind of the challenges. The other challenge of a walkaway split is wherever you put it, you're likely to lose the foragers. And that's not a good thing because they need resources. We'll talk about feeding in just a minute. So keep in mind that there's some techniques that I use. There's always the uh, hard, fast rule in beekeeping that you can move this split two or three miles away and then leave it there for two weeks and then bring it back. And so that will allow a lot of the foragers to stay put. They go to the new place that you take them to and then take, they reorientate. And then you wait two weeks and bring them back and they reorientate again to the new location. You don't lose foragers that way. Another way that I've been 80 to 90% successful with, I'll move the, the nuke box, the split, um, and I'll put it behind something that blocks the entrance a little bit like maybe put it next to a tree or put something in front of it, like a lawn chair or something. And it forces the foragers to take an orientation flight. So sometimes I've been pretty lucky on keeping the hive pretty much together, not losing all the foragers. Um, but that's going to be the challenge when you make a split. And it doesn't matter if you move it five feet, 10 feet or 100 yards. You really have to move them about two to three miles away to get the benefit of the forager staying put and then bring them back a little later. Now I have friends in the area. My, my, one of my daughters and her husband lives about seven miles away. So that's always handy to uh, go over there and say, Hey, I need to move some bees in your yard, but they have a lot of property. So it's not really in their yard. So somebody, you know, like that, you can do it that way as well. Now I want to tell you about the Terranoff uh, split. The Terranoff split, I don't have any pictures of it, so I'm going to have to explain it. So listen closely. Um, the Terranoff split is unique because it's it's a Russian idea from a Russian gentleman. I think his name was G.E. Terranoff. And he came up with the idea 
quite a long time ago, actually. I want to say night in the 40s, but I can't remember, 1940 something. But he came up with the idea and it's gaining more traction. But here's here's how you do it. Let's say you have a hive that is um, ready to swarm or likely to swarm soon. And so before they swarm, what you do, you build a ramp. Now, it can be a flat piece of uh, plywood, something like that. It needs to be about the same width as your bottom board entrance, which is about 14 inches. And what you want to do is you want to uh, prop this flat piece up so that it lines up with the entrance of the hive, but it doesn't touch the bottom board. In fact, it needs to be, there needs to be a gap between the board, the ramp, and the bottom board of four inches. That's the magic number. About four, five inches. So in other words, like if here's your bottom board here, the ramp is going to go up like this and not connect to the bottom board, but it'd be about four inches back. So what you do now, which is very labor intense, but you take all your frames and you shake all the bees off. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot one step. You need to lay, like if you had a white sheet or something, you need to lay a sheet over this ramp. It, it helps the bees to lay something, a, a towel or a sheet. And what's going to happen? You're going to shake all the bees onto this. And it's this is the way it's supposed to work. The older bees are, are foragers. They are flying flying bees. And the idea is that nurse bees are going to stay. Young bees are usually what we find mostly in swarms. And so the young bees are going to stay on the ramp. And the older bees are going to go back into the hive. They weren't going to swarm with the swarm anyway. So they're going to go back in the hive. On this ramp leading up to the bottom board with the four inch gap between the top of the ramp and the and their entrance, they're going to form a swarm cluster underneath the ramp. That's right. Um, some people even let the uh, cloth hang down a few inches um, past the ramp and they'll start accumulating in this great big ball and you're generating a swarm. And it's likely that the, the queen is going to be there because she is well mated. She's not flying into the hive either, right? So all at once, what you've done, you, you put the frames back in, but now you have all the bees that are old enough to fly a little bit older bees are going to go back in, take care of the hive. Now you have a swarm. You've generated a tearing off split by making them do a swarm for you. <laughs> it's amazing. So try that. It doesn't take, you know, it's not really difficult to do. Um, I think the trick is just, or uh, I guess the, the, the labor intensiveness of that is can be intense. You're going to shake, you're going to shake. Like in my case, uh, some of my hives have, um, they have uh, three boxes, two deeps and a super coming out of winter. So I got to shake 30 frames of bees. And so I, I really am not a fan of, of that technique only because it's so labor intense. I mean, bees are going to be everywhere when you do it, but if you should try it. You may love this. Now, I have noticed that several of you have been asking me about a flyback um, split, I guess you would call it. And, um, boy, I'm going to have to really think back in my, my the dusty old brain up here. I think his name was Gus Mitchell, um, who came up with this one. I may have his name wrong, but it seems like that rings a bell. But um, I think it's unique to him. I've not heard a lot about it, but I think some people have been asking me about it. Um, but it's when you, it's labor intense too, because you walk up to a hive, let's say two deeps in a soup or whatever, and you move it off of its hive stand, or you move all the boxes off. Then you put a new bottom board in an empty box onto the hive stand, and then you move a frame over uh, with the queen on it, and you put that in this uh, deep boxes, the deep box, and then you put foundation or frame uh, foundationless frames in there as well. And uh, then you you're actually what you're trying to do is is actually build like a cell builder. I think in, in a lot of instances, you can use a queen excluder or a double screen board or something like that to bring the boxes, other frames back on top of that and let them start trying to make a queen uh, due to the separation of those two boxes. So a double screen would work better. Um, but anyway, that's that's a technique. That's a flyback. 
And the idea too, in this case, is similar to the tearing off is that the older bees that you've moved over a little bit, well, they're all just going to fly back into the, the new box that you put on the hive stand that has the queen and the frame with the queen on it. So all the older bees are moving back. All the younger bees are going to stay put up above. That's kind of your swarm. And they're going to make uh, queen cells and um, start a hive above there. So that makes sense. Well, that's that's a flyback. Now, I want to touch on these two. That The Demeray method is not really a splitting method, although it kind of is. Because I have a whole video. I'm not going to go into great detail right now. I don't have time to go into the Demeray. I've made a whole video. Search my channel, look for my Demeray method, and I'll explain it. But uh, Mr. Demeray came up with a great way of swarm control without taking your hive all apart, without separating it or making splits. You you can make a split because it does generate queen cells and all if you wanted to. But you can, the Demeray method is really the heart of it is keeping the hive together so that you don't have to make splits, but you don't lose them in a swarm. That maximizes your honey production for the year. And of course, as I mentioned, another common practice is using a double screen board uh, for swarm control too. Uh, in the case of the flyback hive, or I think it's called flyback. Is it fly away or flyback? I thought it was flyback. But the double screen board, a lot of people use the double screen board and they actually do the similar things again, uh, separating um, the hive uh, by younger and older bees and forcing them to raise a queen. But the benefit of using a swarm control or um, a double screen bottom board or double screen board for this is that it has a big screen. It actually has two screens. You don't want one, one screen only because uh, too much, too many pheromones to be transferred and, and such, but a double screen on each side of the board uh, allows, uh, creates this big gap where, pheromones can't be transferred by touch. And so in this case, they will be forced to raise a queen on one side, but the screen in the middle actually allows a lot of heat to transfer from the bottom up. So this is something that helps if you're doing it early in the spring as well. And so that's, we, that's, those are the methods, uh, pretty much the common methods that people use. Now let's talk about feeding splits. My goodness. Um, is it a good idea to feed splits? Uh, here's an image from a video that I made just a couple of days ago about feeding. I'm starting to feed my bees now. And yeah, I think feeding your splits, it's always a good idea because they may really have lost a lot of their foragers. They may have flown back to the parent hive. So if you can feed them, it's going to help so much. I use one-to-one -one sugar water and then it looks orange or kind of brown because I add the amino bee booster, the honey bee healthy, and the pollen protein substitute. And we sell those additives, but those, um, those are the things that I add to my sugar water. Just so that you, um, just so that you know, I want to tell you how I do it. I add a teaspoon of each, a teaspoon of honey, be healthy teaspoon of amino B booster and a teaspoon of the ultra B protein. Uh, I guess it's called uh, pollen substitute powder. It's all called ultra B. So I use the, a teaspoon of those three, Two, I put, I add that to one quart of sugar water, one to one sugar water. One to one sugar water is one part sugar, one part water. And so that's how the, that I make those up. And that's what I'm feeding. Now, if I don't worry about having to feed my parent colony, because when I make my splits, they're already going out and getting a lot of nectar. So there's no re reason for me to feed them. They have resources. It's just my, my splits that I worry might suffer from a lack of foragers. Oh, let's see. I got that in there twice. Okay, what about queens and splitting? Now, we talked a little bit about that. That's one of the queens that I raised one year, and she was so dark. Um, so you can decide when you make a split whether you want to take the queen in the split or leave the queen behind and buy a queen for the split or let the split raise her own. I think the split has too much working against them to make them raise their own queen. They don't have a lot of brood like the parent colony does, right? So for me personally, I have always found the advantage is to take the queen like, like if they swarmed. So I'm trying to create the swarming 
all the atmosphere of a swarm. I'm I'm taking the queen away that, that she leaves with the swarm. I'm taking some brood, some bees away in my in my split. So when I take uh, four or five frames of brood and some honey out and the queen out, the parent hive has to go to work because they don't have a queen and they don't have all their bees and they don't have all the frames pulled out. So they have a lot of work to do. That that alleviates them swarming. So I like to take the the queen with my split. Now, if you don't like to do that, if you have other reasons you don't want to do that, you certainly can. But then you have to decide, is it better to let them raise a queen or do you want them or do you want to give them a mated queen? Problem with me is by when I'm making splits, um, sometimes I can't buy or raise mated queens at that time. It's too early for me to raise them, too early for me to buy them. So that's why I just let them raise it themselves. Um, but that's kind of the issue at hand with the queens. And then how about the number of splits? How many splits can you make from one gigantic overwintered colony? Well, you can make quite a bit. I think I've told you guys one time I made 30 nucleuses from an overwintered colony. And I was desperate to sell nukes. And so I uh, just took one frame out of bees and uh, gave each of those frames a, a queen cell and let them mature out to be a five frame nucleus. So, you know, you can take, you can make a lot of bees, um, make a lot of nukes from one colony. But if you're wanting to uh, get a lot of honey out of that colony and you keep making a lot of splits, it's going to be tougher for them to have a bumper crop. Now, if you do it early enough in the year, it can pan out. It depends on your season and how long your season lasts. I can do it early and still have a bumper honey crop because we have a honey flow starting, um, oh, with dandelions. And it runs all the way through probably to mid-August. Early to mid-August is when our real strong honey flow stops. So we have a tremendously long, in my, in my opinion anyway, from what I've heard other people tell me, we have a long uh, period of good nectar flow. But uh, remember that the number of splits that you make kind of, it kind of um, depends on how, if you're using this technique to, to control swarms, for example, if I, if I make one split from a strong colony, hoping I can make that colony not swarm, as soon as they raise a queen, they're going to swarm. So I have to go back and make another split or deal with uh, them not swarming again. So don't think one split will be enough to keep them from swarming that season. It may not be. You may have to make another split as soon as that new queen they raise starts laying eggs. So keep an eye on queen cells. That's kind of the rough thing that we deal with. And But on the other hand, if you're a strong beekeeper, if, if you have a lot of knowledge and a strong constitution, you can certainly go out there and make two to four splits over a two-month period from a very strong colony. And they can keep rebounding in the spring. I mean, look at the picture here and how many flowers are out there. I mean, so they can build up really rapidly. A strong colony can pull one frame out in just a day or two. And so they can really keep going and, and make some, you know, fantastic um, splits. And finally, we want to talk about mites. And this is the question I get asked a lot is how, how can we actually um, deal with mites? Uh, should we? treat for mites before we make a split or should we split and then deal with mites? And I'm kind of leaning toward, you know, there's, there's no certain exact science or way that you have to do this. It's a matter of opinion, but um, I like the idea of treating the, the main hive first uh, because most of the treatment, um, the, the label describes the treatment in such a way that it has to be done usually like on a large colony, two deeps, you know, put, put the treatments between the brood boxes and all that. So it's easier. Like if you tar start trying to figure out the equation of treating a nucleus, a lot of the chemical treatments that you use, their description does not tell you how to treat a five frame nucleus box. So now you're guessing at dosage and that's not fun. So I, you know, I probably recommend treating the hive before you make that split and it, and it helps um, all those bees kind of get the vapor, whatever technique you're using, and to kill the mites before you make that split. And that's one way to do it. Plus, I never like treating a small group of bees. I think it's hard on them for sure. All right. Well, that's uh, that's my 
uh, presentation tonight on making splits. I hope it's been helpful for you guys. Always like to spend all the way down to the bottom of the hour teaching, sharing my thoughts on uh, bees. And I hope this information here is very relevant to you guys uh, as well. I want to thank you for any of the donations for our live stream that I may have missed during my teaching there. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, anything you can do to support the cause is greatly appreciated. And remember, uh, if you can't figure out or don't want to donate here on YouTube, uh, you can always make a donation. You'll see a link show up every now and again in the comments how you can donate uh, from our website. Okay, Randy says, uh, being a newbie, we have one hive second year now. Are splits required? Oh, that's a good question. Let me wet my whistle. Hmm. All right. Uh, Randy, they're not required, but you're probably going to see them fly to the trees. Um, if you have a strong colony coming out of winter, they are going to split because all honeybee colonies will reproduce. It'd be unlikely that they would not reproduce. So you're definitely going to lose half of them. And that's going to cut down on your honey production, especially if it, if it occurs later in the swarm season rather than early. You don't have to, but if you live in a crowded neighborhood, the swarm's going to land on somebody's motorcycle or your or some play, playground equipment at the school. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of scary. So it's responsible for us as beekeepers that live in cities. I don't. Um, but it's responsible for us to control our swarming. Um, yeah. I've lost plenty of swarms. Oh, my gosh. Into the trees. Uh, thanks so much for the great information. And is it possible to split a hive you're starting this spring and early summer? I really appreciate this question so much. I can't tell you I'm pumped and excited about this question because the answer is it all depends. I have been informed by highly intelligent people that whenever anybody asks me a beekeeping question, I am to precede it with these words. Well, it depends. <laughs> no, seriously, I, uh, I'm i reluctant to ever start a new hive like from a package or a nucleus and then try to make a split that same year. I really am reluctant to do that. Can you do it? I think so. But I think you're going to have to be an experienced beekeeper. I think you're going to have to really keep a watchful eye, keep equalizing the two hives out so that they can continue to expand. The, your chances are greater that if you make a split the first year, the chance is great that neither of them will really do fantastic. They might do well. They might make it enough to build up for winter, but I doubt you're going to get a bumper honey, honey crop. I doubt you're going to see uh, just an enormous amount of bees that you need. So a little, I'm a little reluctant to do it, but that's me personally. I don't own the corner of all knowledge but that's just been my experience. I once uh, was advising a gentleman who wanted to take a package and it immediately split it into two different hives and he had a spare queen. So that reduced a, a 10,000 bees or a three pound package down to 1.5 or 5,000 bees. And he put a queen in each one. He was not experienced and it did not go well. Remember, I've always said you can take a cup of bees if you know what you're doing, give them a queen early in the year, and they'll likely pull it off because I've done it before. But you got to know what you're doing. That's a very good question. Yeah. Hey, Brian, thanks for joining us on the live stream. Always good to see you, sir. And thanks for that donation tonight. Appreciate it a lot. So much. Hey, Josh, how are you doing? Can a damari uh, be done before low temps are in the 40s? I have a hive that is busting at the seams, but we won't be above 40s for another two months. Uh, it's not a good idea, no, because uh, in the damari method, we don't really want to see clustering, and they're going to cluster if it gets below 50. It's going to be tricky. It really would be. You know, that's when it's warm enough for the bees to exist out of the cluster and go into different Bot high bodies and the super dividing them and all. Yeah, I don't think I'd recommend that just because of the clustering problem that may occur. I mean, um, it might work okay, but I, I personally wouldn't try until it was a lot warmer. Bees are going to do much better at reproducing and raising queens and, and doing all they need to do 
uh, when it's warm enough for them to do it. Bees make more bees when it's hotter, for sure. Oh. All right. When feeding one-to-one -one sugar water, can raw sugar be used instead of processed sugar? Uh, raw, oh, raw sugar. I'm not sure exactly what the reference is to raw sugar, but I think you're talking about the brown sugar. And no, that is not good for bees. For some reason, any dark sugar like molasses or brown sugar and stuff like that, not good for bees. So um, I, I wouldn't really be scared of processed sugar. I know it has a bad name. I know it has, you know, the whole word process. We're not supposed to eat processed food and all, but bees really do quite well with sugar. You'd be amazed. <laughs> and I've read some studies. Some studies show that bees do as well, if not better, with sugar than honey. So I know that's debatable. Some people don't like it. It was one study, I think, out of Canada. But um, sugar has never been uh, bad at all. My, my bees love uh, sugar. Is there a preferred time of the day to do splits? Uh, you know, that's probably not going to be um, real... Um, I don't think it's going to make a big difference, Amber. It could. Um, I've often thought that if you do splits later in the year or later in the day, you know, like in the afternoon, they may not be so apt for the foragers to go back to the parent hive or for them to all go back, whatever. But then as soon as the sun comes up, they're all back doing what they want to anyway. So I would say that I do it just in the morning. The reason I do it in the morning is because um, that's when I see bees uh, usually uh, swarming. They, For me, my bees will always swarm early in the morning, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. So that seems to be um, giving them enough time to, to swarm and find their new location. So bees like to move out in the morning. I don't think it's going to make a big, big difference for you. Really don't. Thank you, Sally. I thank you for your donation. And uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. Jessica Bennett. Uh, oh, Kansas City, Missouri. You guys have some nasty weather too, I bet, tonight. So be careful. Be safe. We're planning a walkaway split when we inspect. If we see queen cells, do we leave or remove them? I love that question. It is a very good question, Jessica. And it's a question that stumps so many, many beekeepers new and experienced. It really does. Because you can really do either one. When you're inspecting your hive and you want to do a walkaway split and you see queen cells, aha, guess what? You have a lot of leverage. You really do. Because let's say you have several queen cells and they're on a couple or three different frames. Aha, you can make two or three different splits because you have queens about to emerge. Oh, that's so wonderful. I, I love queen cells. It gives me so much leverage. So you can do either way. You can leave a queen cell behind and take the mother queen out if she's still there. Uh, that's kind of tricky. And oftentimes she's not there if you see queen cells. But if you see her and there's queen cells, you could do it either way. So it's your call which way you want to do it. Um, it's going to work fine either way. The and remember that when you have a queen cell, it still means that the queen has to emerge. She has to go on a mating flight. So she's got to fly a couple of miles away in all kind of weather, hopefully a good day, but she may be eaten by a dragonfly or a bird. So just because you put a queen cell in there, remember there's a lot that has to happen for her to get mated and come back and be uh, mated the rest of her life and start laying. So you may want to consider dropping two queen cells in there. A lot of beekeepers, um, sometimes even when we're raising queens, we might put two queen cells in one mating nook just in case, you know, there's a failure or something. Yeah, that's a good question though. It, it can go, you can just, you can just choose what you want to do. Oh, and by the way, be careful with the queen cells. Um, let's, I don't really have a queen cell with me, but let's say this little thing is a queen cell. Um, if you um, hold it this way before, about day 13, it's not good. And you want to hold them in this position, this vertical position. So if you cut them off or move them or something, put them in your pocket. Don't let them fall sideways. It can actually injure your queen's wings and she can't mate after that. Yep. 
Hey, Jess, how are you tonight? I uh, don't want to create additional hives in the spring. If I religiously keep rotating the frames with the bottom of the top with the Damari with a super strong colony, never overpopulate. Well, they're going to overpopulate, um, but it sounds like you're going to keep giving them plenty of room and boxes. The, the bees will always overpopulate, no matter what you rotate, what you move around. The queen is going to lay 2,000 eggs a day, so she's going to lay them everywhere she can. But yeah, if you can reduce her to one section, like in the Damari method, you're reducing her down below, a queen excluder, um, you can keep you can keep the populations down because queens get they get honey bound or pollen bound or brood bound. They can't lay any more eggs. So um, I would say experiment with that and see, I don't see why that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be something that would work for you. But it, again, it's labor intense. I'm not a, I'm not a labor intense beekeeper. I take the shortcuts, the easiest way, the quickest way to do the same thing. And so sometimes these techniques do require a lot more attention, but it's worth trying just. Hey, Mike, uh, do you prefer a walk away with a mated queen or a double screen board split with a mated queen? Yeah. Now, these are the questions I know that all of you are, are uh, toying with and you're wondering. And what I pre you asked me what I prefer. Do you prefer? So I prefer the walk away. Um, I really do. Because um, I like being able to go out there to a to a hive that's just busting out, ready to swarm. And I like taking four or five frames out. I like taking their queen out and I walk away with the heart of the hive, leaving the parent hive that's very strong, got a lot of brood, a lot of food, a lot of population to raise their own queen, start picking up the ball again. And now I have uh, a strong queen and strong bees and my nuke. So that's, that's better for me than trying the double screen board split. I mean, it, you can do it. It works fine. Uh, but you're still going to have to walk away with it eventually, right? So I just like to walk away with that nucleus. Yeah. Let me check my time. Okay, we got a little bit of time here. Thank you, G. York. I appreciate your donation tonight. Is pinching the old queen prior to a swarm departing effective at, at all in preventing the swarm from leaving? Yes, yes, and yes and no. So yes and yes wins, but then yes and no is it all depends. So, you know, here's the deal with that. If you see that your hive has got queen cells in there and your queen is marked, that's essential, and you know that's your original queen, then you take her and you pinch her, you kill her, then it's going to be hard for them to swarm because they know they don't have a queen. But if they're right on the verge of it, they might go ahead and swarm without her. That's the yes, no part. <laughs> and they might land in the tree and they can do two things. I've seen it both ways. A queenless swarm can land in a tree nearby and then fly right back in and say, what the heck? Where's mom? Oh, okay. Well, we need to raise a queen. But I've also seen them stay in that tree forever and start building comb without a queen. Bees can do strange things when those strange occurrences happen. But I would say for the most part, yeah, if you uh, kill the queen and and uh, let them raise a queen from the, the, the queen cells, that's going to not, um, you use the word prevent, so the answer is no. It won't prevent it, but it will postpone it. That's a key word. So as soon as they raise one of those queens up, she lays some eggs, boom, same thing's going to happen all over again. You've got to kill that queen and keep that queen from swarming. See, so this gets into this thing where, it's a losing battle during the swarm season, which lasts about 30 to 45 days. So for about a month and a half, almost two months, you're going to have to go out there and manage queens. <sighs> it's easier for me just to walk away with the queen, take her, take her hostage into a nucleus and with some bees and be done with it. Good question. Fair enough. I like it. Andy. Hi, David. What about lighter sugar syrup? Say one to four. I hear it encourages wax building better is thinner, better. Uh, yeah, in my experience, I've heard that too. I've heard people say that. And I personally have never tried thinner syrup before, but I've heard people say that. Um, nectar is pretty thin. Nectar in the flowers can be, what, 80% water. So it's not one-to-one. -one. So they're making, you know, bees are making it with very thin nectar. 
Um, I like one-to-one -one because it gives them the ability to have a lot of sugar for a lot of other reasons too. A lot of carbohydrates for mandibular gland, hypofrangeal gland production of raw jelly. It gives them the ability to dry it down a little quicker if they want to put it in their brood nest area. And uh, yeah, but I have heard uh, thinner is better. I'm sticking with one-to-one. -one. <laughs> you try that and let me know. Wow, Robert, thank you for your donation tonight. I re I'm receiving a package. I have plenty of drawn out frames. Can I place just drawn out frames or use both? Thanks for all you do. I think, Robert, you mean both meaning undrawn and drawn. And yeah, the best thing to do is use as much drawn out foundation as you can. And when you install your package, they'll go right to work. And the, that gives you a queen ability. Once they clean that and get it ready for her, they'll start laying down to build as much comb. You can use both. What I would like to see is probably put uh, the queen, you know, she's going to be placed in the middle of your deep box maybe. And I would put a couple, I'd put the queen cage right between two drawn frames on both sides. So when she comes out, she has immediately has 14,000 cells between the two frames that she can lay in and then put the other drawn ones uh, beyond that. That'd be really good. That's another good question. Hey, Carol Livingston, how are you doing tonight? Good to see you. Wow. What temperatures during the days and nights are warm enough for all these bee related, you know, syrup feeding, splits, and grafting? Yeah, I wish I knew the answer to that. But um, what I would like and what the bees would enjoy the most is as warm as possible. But if we wait too long, they're going to swarm. So we're playing this terrible game of roller coaster temperatures and trying to keep our bees from swarming, but trying not to split them too early when they die. And I'll confess, I've made too early splits before, and I've lost them. And so I don't like to make my splits too early anymore, but then I'm, I'm at risk of swarming. So probably the magic uh, number, if I were to grab something out of thin air, I would say if my temperatures are not dropping below 40 at night, I can get by with making a split at night. But man, I live in Illinois. I just looked at my phone today in the forecast. I'm dipping into the, I'm dipping to 28 degrees in the next few days for low temperatures. So that's going to stay steady for about a week. So way too cold to make splits for me. So yeah, that's a good question. Hi, David. Thank you for your donation, uh, David. Appreciate that a lot. Thank you guys for always supporting our channel. It, it does mean a lot to us uh, to pay the bills, helps us to pay the bills and continue to do live streaming. All right, let's take a couple more questions, and we have got another giveaway coming. Um, you've said that we should replace queens every two years. Can this be accomplish, accomplished by letting them swarm? Then you're left with a new queen. Yes, you can. Uh, if you let them swarm, again, you're feeding bees out into somewhere, and that can be fine if they're just going out like bees do into nature, but if they're going and affecting your neighbors, that can be scary. On the other hand, you have to think about the quality of the queen that you're getting from a swarm cell versus one that you might buy or raise yourself. But in most cases, I think it's it's fine. You, you know, that's certainly you can do that. Um, they are going to replace their queen every year. And when they do swarm, it is going to cut down on the mites because that break in the brood cycle is going to break the brood cycle of the mites as well. So there's some benefits. Some, some bees like... Uh, uh, the Africanized bee, uh, they swarm so often that that's why they have lower mite counts because of the rapid amounts of swarms that they produce. Good question. Hey, Mike. Oh, thank you for your donation tonight. Appreciate your videos and live stream. I appreciate that, Mike Hansen. Good to see you tonight. Um, I think Sherry and Jessica and myself speak uh, uh, as one voice saying that we really do enjoy the live streams and putting them together, answering questions. And helping you guys out is all about supporting one another. You know, when um, when I was a youngster, I did so much on my own because I was raised in the 60s. Thanks, Amber. Wow. Thank you for your super sticker. I was raised in the 60s. And so it's, it's not that my parents were negligent, but I don't think they cared where I was during the daytime. And that was common of all kids, at least in my neighborhood. I don't know if it was common of all parents of that time period, but Maybe it was. Leave a comment if, if, if it was for you, if you were raised in the 60s. But, you know, I could leave the house in the summertime on my bike. And my parents didn't care where I was until I had to be home for the, the streetlights came on. 
And so as a result, I learned so much stuff on my own. Um, you know, just people telling me I was always exploring and adventurous. And that's when I carried that over to beekeeping when I, in my thirties, that same attitude of like, I'm going to just really learn about beekeeping. But I did learn a lot. I subscribed pretty early on to Bee Culture magazine. And, uh, and I really did enjoy reading all that uh, stuff that people smarter than me were talking about in the magazine. And it wasn't an internet back then when I started beekeeping. So I didn't have YouTube. I didn't have a lot of bee clubs or the, the research done on bees was just nilched compared to what it is now. So much harder time for me to get started. But as I grew into it, I just used the same skill set that I developed as a kid and, you know, learning how to fix my own bike, my own motorcycle, my mini bike, my go-kart, keep my go-kart running, uh, build tree houses and all that. So that's always a lot of fun. Um, and I hope you guys are finding beekeeping can be something that you can unilaterally use a lot of different skills, you know, carpentry or thinking through splits and biology of bees. And it's just a lot of fun. Well, let's do, let's go ahead and do one more giveaway tonight before everybody goes. Let's see. Okay. We're going to call this one hashtag P A C K hashtag pack. We'll start collecting those comments. See if I did that right. All right. Give me a second to get this all configured. I'm going to have to show Sherry and Jessica how to do this because apparently it's not as easy as I think. All right, let's see, present, screen share. All right, here it is, share the screen. All right. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we're going to give away the same items again tonight. Uh, once again, we got this pack of booklets for you. We've got a book on bee health, honey bee health, written by John Zavishlock. And we got another book that John and I wrote on raising quality queens. And we have a nice little uh, log of pages that you, when you do your inspections, you can kind of write down, uh, different things that you see in uh, the booklet. So that'd be a nice little pack of books to get you ready. Cause some of you are brand new to beekeeping and, uh, you're kind of like, oh, I need to figure this out. I need to know these pests and diseases. Um, that was one of the last things that I got excited about when I was a new beginner is learning all the pests and diseases. It wasn't until I was applying to be, um, and a master beekeeper that I really had to study all the different pests and diseases and treatments and all that. And so that, that was uh, something that moved me forward to learn more about these diseases. So I guarantee you, well, I can't guarantee it, but I'm pretty sure if you read and study all the different pests and diseases and understand what they look like and how to deal with them, it's going to make you such a better beekeeper. All right, let's see what we got here. 248 people with almost 500 people watching tonight. Thanks guys for joining me. I want to say, I love you guys. Appreciate you so much for being part of the live stream tonight. All right, let's do a draw. You ready? Here we go. We're drawing who will win the pack of books. Oh boy. People's names are going by. Hey, Craig Davis. I like that hat. There you go, Craig. Congratulations. Yeah, be sure and email longleanhoneybees at gmail.com, Craig, and let them know that you won. And don't forget, next week we're going to have Hive for Heroes. And and I'll try to uh, remember that we need to... Um, is it next week, Sherry? No? Is it April the 14th? She's giving me hand signals. I have no idea what she's saying. Well, April the 4th? I think she says it's April the 4th. So I'm getting my dates mixed up. High for Heroes may not be next week. <laughs> it sounds like it's coming up April the 4th, but we'll keep you posted. All right. So, oh, there it is. I saw it in front of my face. <laughs> All right. Also, don't forget our classes are going to go on sale March the 14th through the 25th. So that's going to be exciting too. So if you guys are wanting to uh, get some of my online courses, um, that'd be the day to jump in there and get these classes. Our single classes are 50% off and our ultimate class is $100 off with a year subscription to Bee Culture Magazine. So lots of learning going on. That'd be great for you. So keep that in mind coming up. Um, also we have a mentor, I have a mentoring program. If those, if some of you are looking for mentorship, 
uh, check out my B Team 6 mentorship from my website, honeybeesonline.com. So in the last few minutes, I just want to thank you guys so much for being a part of uh, both my YouTube channel and of live stream. I've made uh, several videos this week. Um, I've made one video that's done really well, showing you how to do an inspection, what a, what a hive looks like coming out of winter. And I've also made a video today showing how you feed bees um, in the in the spring. So that's important too. Even if you're getting packages, it's really important to feed your bees in the spring as well. So I want to thank Jessica again and Sherry. And look at that. I want to thank all you guys for donating tonight. So nice of you guys to jump in here and support the cause. It really does help us out a lot. So appreciate it. Big applause to all of you. And we love and appreciate you. I'll leave you with one little note here before I go tonight is that one of the most important things that we can do in life is to serve others. And I feel like I have met my fulfillment in life by serving beekeepers. And I serve in a lot of different ways. I've got a new podcast called The Mysteries of Honeybees. And that's that's been a fun podcast to have. And I make a lot of videos, free videos for you guys and live streams that are free as well. So I have a lot of free content that I give out there. And I also just love serving and helping and loving other people. Bees cooperate with each other to produce uh, honey and a great pollination service to all the trees around them. So we need to find a way in our hearts to really be, I guess, encouraged to support and encourage one another, inspire one another. And uh, no matter how low you might feel now, depressed, lonely, or sad, remember, I'm, I'm with you. I'm on your side. I've got your back. I'm behind you 100%. So I appreciate you being my friend and being here tonight. I'm going to say goodbye tonight, and we're going to see you guys next time. Take care and have a good evening.